Welcome back, everybody, to Love Thy Number. This is part two of the podcast that my mom and I did quite a while back. This is our personal stories of how we experienced leaving religion through both of our unique Enneagram perspectives, which we didn't know at the time, but looking back, it all makes so much sense. I think you'll really get a lot out of this episode, especially if you are in the middle of deconstructing faith, some kind of faith transition, um, not knowing where to go, what you're doing. And I don't mean where to go like a physical building. I mean, how do you take that next leap? So sit back and relax and please bear with us again. We were new to podcasting, and I want to let you know, my poor mom, bless her heart, we recorded this at the height of allergy season, and she just had such a hard time getting through this, but she did it. She was such a trooper. So anyway, this is part two, and I hope if you have any questions, you will reach out to us. You might hear some things like um, an old email address or Spiral Dynamics that my husband, he does on another podcast. Anyway, like I said, this is a couple years old, but it's so pertinent today, and I hope you enjoy. Hopefully, we said enough about the Enneagram to whet your appetite and make you want to do your own study, because this is truly a journey of personal growth. And if you dare to strike out on this journey, if at some point you don't eventually feel very uncomfortable, maybe even remorseful, or at the very least embarrassed at some of the ways that you've interacted with people in the past, like, for instance, the girl who I told who had confessed that she was struggling with depression that I talked about last week when I told her, just tell yourself you're happy and you'll be fine. Uh, I know. I just, when I think about that, I just cringe. But if you don't have those points of references, reference that make you go, hmm, I'm not liking this, <laughs> then you just might want to stick to which golden girl quizzes are you? <laughs> Those are easy and comfortable, but truly, this is about discovering what is keeping you from embracing your true identity, which is wholeness. This is a journey of self-love, and it is hard, but I'd say it's worth it, right? Right, absolutely. And uh, for those of you who were with us uh, for part one, our introduction to the Anagram study, we're hoping to do what we promised in our first session by sharing our personal stories about how and why we left the church communities that we'd been the central part uh, of our whole lives up until the respective days we made the decision to leave. Uh, And I say respective because it was three years after Danae and Doug left when I finally left. But in case you think we've stopped midstream with Doug's presentation of Spiral Dynamics, don't despair. (laughs) We're actually hoping that by tucking our Enneagram information in here, it will actually make it even easier to see how these individual types respond to mankind's movement or evolution along the spiral and how these two models are revealed and demonstrated in the biblical narrative. Doug will be back, (laughs) but he thought by sharing our personal stories that we can give encouragement to the many who are in transition of parting with your traditional church or spiritual community. And that number is huge. We hear a lot about millennials in the throes of change, but let me tell you, it's not just the millennials. The baby boomers, senior citizens, empty nesters, Gen Xers, any other list we might could come (laughs) up with, everyone is feeling this change right now. And for some of them, it's a thrill to be striking out beyond the norm. But for others, it truly is devastating. So if you're going through the big transition right now, as I said last week, you are not alone. That is right. (laughs) And uh, while Danae and I are happy we got through that transition, it was so hard especially for me, and I don't mean to whine and imply that my pain's <laughs> worse than Danae's, but if you heard the, us describe our different Enneagram types, you'll get it. Why she didn't hold on to her pain. Remember, she's a type 7, but I'm a type 2, and we take rejection to infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> so, while some of us 
may say all this inward focus or self-knowledge isn't necessary. Um, some go so far to say that it's selfish or even unbiblical. Mm-hmm. I have actually heard that about the Enneagram, that we should be focusing more on others. Uh, I've heard it, but didn't even the Apostle Paul talk about the dichotomy of his own motives uh, in Romans, when he said, I don't get it. What I want to do, I don't do. But what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. <laughs> don't we all relate to that? <laughs> oh, my goodness, me too. <laughs> and even with Paul's whole lifetime of being prepared to be a spiritual leader, he had to be stopped dead in his tracks mm-hmm. and look inward. That road to Damascus where he was literally stuck blind. Mm-hmm. And at that point, he literally could not look anywhere else for three days but inward. Right. So we're going to share how these particular type 2 and type 7 acted and reacted to having to leave our church community. But, I mean, this was this just didn't happen in one day. This was a lifetime of lessons and experiences which moved us towards that moment. Uh, I remember back in the fifth grade, this is one of my favorite memories, but I went to school with a girl named Marcy, and she happened to be a Mormon. And honestly, in my little fifth grade point of view, she was the nicest girl in the entire school. So one day, I thought about that, and I went up to my dad, who was a preacher. I said, Daddy, why is it that I get to go to heaven? Because I was lucky enough to be born into a family that goes to the right church, and Marcy won't get to go just because she's a Mormon. She's way nicer than me, I told Daddy. I said, that doesn't seem fair. And now, that might seem like a stretch to associate that memory with being a seven, but over the years, I've recognized that I've always been a bit of a troublemaker. (laughs) Well, you had your rebellious moments, but don't think you're the only one. I told you there's a bit of every one of the nine types in us all. Yes, I'm every woman. (laughs) But I think what you're trying to say is that uh, you've always kind of called it like you saw it. And what the Enneagram calls a seven's brash nerviness. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you would have been the one in the story that, of the emperor's new clothes. You would have yelled out, hey, are you all crazy? He's buck naked. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> well, it was obvious. But the truth is, I've always wanted to know why things are the way they are. I got in trouble a lot of times for just questioning things. Like, for instance, why was it okay to go to the theater and watch the dancers perform? But if I wanted to go to a dance, well, that was a sin that would lead me straight to hell, as I was told. (laughs) And that's so characteristic of a seven, the desire to learn and to ask questions. And to want to know why, 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 why? Why is there a boy's diving platform way up in the tree in the Christian camp? (laughs) And the girls was way down low. Right. And by the way, you let them know that it was not just for boys. Uh, She walked past those stunned boys to make that 200-foot climb. Oh, exaggerate much? Uh, Well, it was um, more like 15. But to a mother with acrophobia, it sure seemed like 200. (laughs) But then you made that dive. Mm -hmm. For those of you listening in, that story isn't just to get sympathy for this poor old mother who had to control (laughs) a daring daughter. But it demonstrates that for sevens, curiosity drives and defines them. And while rules are necessary, sevens are quick to ask why. Why can't girls do uh, fill in the blank if (laughs) boys can? Why can't I dance but I can pay good money to go watch someone else do it? (laughs) Why is Marcy going to be lost? Mm. And more and more questions that we all wondered about. Oh, man, so many. (laughs) But you know what? That Marcy the Mormon story, as I've called it over the years, it has just never left my mind. So 30-plus years later, I began questioning and opening my heart to learning things that went beyond the boundaries of the church doctrine that Doug and I were a part of. I saw these things as exciting and freeing, and in typical seven mode, I wanted everybody to get in on this good news ride with me. But like, okay, here's an example. Um, Doug and I were on vacation one time, and I'd always wanted to parasail. And I thought everybody would want a parasail. It just, it looked like so much fun. So I 
told Doug, come on, let's go do this, and we can fly over the ocean. And I didn't know he <laughs> had a fear of heights at the time. But he said, uh, no, that's, that's crazy. You do that, and <laughs> I'll stay down here and uh, do, the, do the camera work. And so I was, I was like, well, why wouldn't you want to do that? But anyway, my perspective was a little one-sided, and that's kind of the same response our church leaders made about the, quote, great news I thought we were sharing. They were like, that's crazy. <laughs> and they warned us that if we did not stop spreading our message anywhere, even in our own home, we were told, that they just could not allow us to continue being a part of that community any longer. Yeah. Oh, I remember that day. Uh too well. Yeah. In we fact, it was a day that most of the world will never forget because it was September 11, 2001. It was the day our world came crashing down in more ways than one. I find that quite ironic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, without taking too much time on the details of Doug's and my story, I want to talk about my reaction to the news that I was no longer welcome to be a part of that church because our story is becoming more and more common as the boundary conflicts are happening in mass numbers across the religious mm -hmm. world. So why can some make the transition easier than others? And also, why? Why did our church leaders not see this, quote, good news <laughs> like I did? It was really, it was just so clear to me. Why wouldn't everyone want to believe that God was not a God of exclusivity. Because I grew up believing that our denomination was the only true church. Yeah. And tr this was the crux of our traditional worldview. And that we alone would be in heaven one day. Mm -hmm. And I say, quote, heaven, because my perspective on that is different. But in, a, in this setting, that's how I saw this, that we would all be going to a destination one day, one day, but it would just be us, sadly. <laughs> but now I can see that there was so much more, there is so much more to God's love, and that He is fair, mm. and that Marcy is okay after oh, all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can see why you were thrilled to gain that understanding of a bigger and better relation to God, but at the same time, you were face-to-face -face with the realization that you just lost community. It's one of your most important yeah. connections until that day. It was. It was all I had ever known. And I'm not going to say I wasn't devastated. I was. But honestly, I was mostly hurt that my children would have to suffer because of what we had done. But the truth was there was no way we could compromise our beliefs and just mm -hmm. keep our mouths shut and keep going for the kids' sake. Because, in fact, I think our kids are stronger now that they're grown adults mm -hmm. um, because of our leaving. But as a seven, it's quite common <laughs> and typical to think that there's always something better just around the corner. And in fact, because I'm also prone to run from pain, I guess I just mentally shut out the pain. Mm -hmm. And again, it took a while to get past the shock, but I truly, I didn't grieve long. And while this is a strength of sevens on the Enneagram, it's also a major weakness. Mm -hmm. It really was a traumatic event in our family's life. And I thought the best thing for everyone would just be to be more positive. <laughs> there, well, there was a small group that left with us, from left that church at the time, and immediately we began planning how we would form a new community. <laughs> and it was exciting. But as I found out years later, I could not transfer my shake it off, let's be happy <laughs> attitude to those I love the most. In fact, one of my dearest relatives once said to me, Danae, everything in life can't be fun. Now, right. now, at the time, I strongly disagreed with him, <laughs> but in truth, he was right. Joy and fun are two different things, and replacing pain with fun isn't a healthy prescription. Right. I really, I wish I'd begun studying the Enneagram many years ago, because I think, or at least I hope, I would have had a little better insight as to each of my children react to stress. Because we have four, and mm -hmm. each one of them is a different number <laughs> on the Enneagram. I don't think they know that, but I, I believe they are. The, I, there should have been more com conversations. I should have sat with each of them individually and tried to be empathetic, to put my instincts aside and help them verbalize their feelings. Well, it's, it's been a long learning experience, and I truly am sorry that they had to suffer. 
but I do believe that they're now more equipped to handle the challenges of life than if we had compromised our integrity. Oh, I do too. And isn't that a perfect example of what Doug is sharing in the podcast on spiral dynamics in relation to the biblical narrative? Yes, yes. It's so important to realize that change, growth, evolution, whatever we call it, it does not mean that we feel we are better than those before us. Just because we've heard more facts or learned more about a subject. Um, and I say that because some of the ones I love most have responded what I thought was my good news message by saying, oh, you think you've got all the answers. Like you think you know everything right, now. I know. <laughs> right. And that couldn't be further from the truth. I do not think I'm smarter than my grandparents uh, who moved to, uh, from North Texas to South Texas in a covered wagon, <laughs> four kids. It took them a whole month. And do I think they were dumb? When I can cover that same distance now in a few hours in a mm-hmm. car, don't even think I imagined that I could do what they did. I know I couldn't. I just have information now that they didn't have. And what I was learning brought out the seven in me. I could question and look for answers now without the fear I was wandering off the narrow way and away from God's favor. And I saw that favor a lot more favorable than I had ever imagined. (laughs) Absolutely. So, Mom, that all being said, you decided to stay in that church when Doug and I left. Knowing what you know about your typology or your number now, can you explain why you stayed? Well, um... I guess for others to understand, I I think I need to share a bit of my story first. Not all of it. We do have time limits, you know. Oh, it's so good. I wish we could. (laughs) We have the best family. (laughs) Because my story is a lot like so many of you who've joined us or like someone you know. Uh, As an Enneagram Type 2, this is how I saw it. I've always felt I had the most enviable life growing up. I even saw myself as a female Paul, (laughs) you know, (laughs) the apostle. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that one. Sanctified, law-abiding, Bible-believing, zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And just like Paul, I was proud of my heritage. He even described himself as the Hebrew of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I felt the same pride for my family. They were full of respectable, law-abiding people. In fact, my mother's father was a constable. Oh, my (laughs) And my dad, oh, he was such a hard worker, and he even owned his own business. But, you know, he always made time for the family after work. We'd go on fishing trips many days. And uh, my dad was really respected in the town. And he gave so much of his time serving. He was an elder and a teacher in our church. And I even remember our own family sitting in the living room. Our chairs circled around hearing Daddy read the Bible to us. And my mom, <laughs> oh, our ma, our ma, she didn't have an official title, but if our church had the position of get-her-done person, that would have been mom. Amen. <laughs> she cooked for the sick. She visited the weak. Uh, she had showers, entertained the teens, taught ladies' class, and all of that while she was working a full-time job. And she still does a lot I of know. this. And although she hasn't taken the test yet, I'm pretty sure she's a seven because we had us some fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My mom and dad were married 75 years, and what we saw is a better-than-Hollywood love story. So commitment was inbred in us three kids. My sister, who's seven years younger than I, uh, was given a Bible name, Candice. And I don't mean after Queen Candace and Acts, mm-hmm. but you know how in the Bible the names given to the children just seemed to fit them when they grew up and had their own grown-up personalities? Well, even from a baby, my sister, we call her Candy, and she fits her name because not only me, but everyone who knows her says it. She is the sweetest thing. I know her personally. <laughs> I would attest is. to that. And my brother Charles whom we call Ike. He was my special gift. He was born on my 13th birthday, and we've just had a special bond ever since. Now, Ike has a gift for making people feel heard when he looks you right in the eyes, like what you have to say is so important to him. And truly, if you can't get along with Ike Park, 
Say it with me now. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can't, can't get, get along, along with, with anybody. anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had lots of great time with both sets of my grandparents. I was so blessed. And I had lots of an uh, uncles and aunts and even great uncles and aunts who were close enough, and they did their part to help nurture and guide and especially to encourage me. I was never abused in any way by any of them. I grew up feeling totally loved and valued and wanted. I'm going to have to say, if if I did not know so many of these people <laughs> and have been an active part in my growing up with them, I'd say, this just sounds too good to be true. It does. See, it's like <laughs> Pleasantville. And, we, and my grandmother, I, she's still around having parties and That's right. just serving everyone. Making us happy. But uh, those days... Uh, in my childhood were when the church had week-long gospel meetings and uh, we wouldn't have thought of asking a visiting preacher to stay at the Holiday Inn. Mm -hmm. No, they always stayed with some of the church members and that very often meant one of the park kids was giving up their bed for a week. <laughs> but we didn't care. Uh, those were some of the most learned men with the most revered names in our brotherhood and we kind of thought it was a fair trade. Our beds, in exchange for a week's worth of their funny personal preacher stories, and to hear their great thundering sermons. And the local preachers, they felt free to stop by our house, even late at night after they'd finished their work, because they know they were going to get coffee and cold biscuits left on the stove after Ooh, breakfast. And what was it? <laughs> Sorghum? We would mash up the butter and the and the syrup, syrup, yeah, and yeah. put it on those cold biscuits. <laughs> And in fact, my parents were the poster children for hospitality. Everyone was welcome. So we had lots of people around our kitchen table. And Kingsville, where we lived, had a Navy jet training base and a university. And Daddy had been in the Navy, and he had a soft spot for those Navy kids so far from their home. And Mom, she fed lots of those college kids who were missing their own mama's mm, home cooking. Bless her heart. So you can imagine... From a teenage girl's perspective, that's me, those were great times because one of those hungry college kids was Jack Fowler and the gorgeous hunk I married. <laughs> he was. <laughs> he borrowed a line uh, from an old movie, and he told me, stick with me, baby, and we'll go places. And we did. Oh, boy, did you. <laughs> lots of countries and states and towns and lots of places. Was, uh, Jack's degree was in engineering. But he fulfilled my uh, childhood dream when he left the engineering to go into the ministry. And we had three perfect children. Three? Danae, oh, yes. Oh, oh, yeah, my And brothers. Greg <laughs> and Jeff. <laughs> and we followed the traditions of our fathers. We taught classes, ran joy buses, we went on mission trips. And we opened our home for Bible studies and meals, celebration, and lots of visitors. We were going to retire in March of 1994 when we intended to go places some more. But in September 1993, Jack died of brain cancer. Mm. That was another difficult life transition. Right. Exactly. But that's when we asked you to move to Atlanta from Texas. Mm -hmm. um, my brother Greg was living here at the time also. And so we said, come on, Mom, why don't you just come be with us in Atlanta. And so you did, and you joined us and became a part of the community right. or the church that we were a part of for oh, years. Yeah. Right. And uh, typically following the only pattern I knew, I jumped right into the community life with that church. And I tried to do all the things I had prepared for all those years before, uh, and even adding grief support counseling to the list of areas where I felt I could help and the church could not have been more helpful to me, just what I needed, until 9-11. Yes, Doug's and my departure date, as we've told you about. Right. And now to your original question, Danae, why did I stay for three years after you and Doug left? Because I thought I could help. Naturally. <laughs> a two. <laughs> a two. <laughs> really? So after Doug and Danae were asked to leave our church, I asked to meet with the church's overseers. They were fully aware that I was teaching the same scriptural views that Danae and Doug had been. So I asked them, now what's going to be my place here in this church? 
and they really assured me that they wanted me to stay, but I would not be allowed to teach any longer if I taught the views they'd heard I'd come to believe about scriptures. It was part of my life to discuss scriptures, but they told me the subject was closed. At that time, I was so angry and so hurt, and it took me a long time to understand that those men couldn't compromise their convictions any more than I could. I had had years of study to come to that conclusion. And I have to say that it helps me now to remember that with only one exception, every one of those men seemed saddened, as saddened as I was, that we were severing fellowship. Mom, you've been a Bible teacher for a great part of your life. So why did you still feel you had to stay there? Well, I kept going there because (laughs) it was my reasoning that being at church and staying connected, I would have more opportunity maybe for dialogue with uh, someone, anyone of my friends, even outside the walls of the building, but the opposite was true. Uh, And I'm not discounting any of the amazing, wonderful works that church does and is still doing. But now the words of some of the songs that I was hearing and the message and the sermons and the obvious behavior that let me know I was no longer in good standing, that led me to believe I was not helping them or me. The separation between us continued to grow. And for an Enneagram 2, relationship Mm -hmm. is everything. Right. (laughs) Remember twos intuit others' feelings, and we see ourselves through lens of our relationship. I imagined myself staying, even knowing I was no longer wanted, but I imagined our relationship history would mean as much as I had imagined. Uh, And this too needed community, and I thought they would realize they needed me too, but that didn't happen. (laughs) Mm. Ouch. Twos need to hear you're wanted. We need a voice like, I guess, Tom Cruise saying, you complete me. Oh, 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 no. So, while that's a great movie line, it is not true. You are complete on your own. That's right. And see, the unhealthy two imagines they need to save somebody. Right. I thought it was up to me to save them and others I knew I loved. Uh, Because, you see, if we ignore the warnings, unhealthy twos spiral downward, and then all feeling like a mortar will rear its ugly head. So more and more, I felt like that picture of the baby seal all alone on the vast ocean on an ice flow. (laughs) See, it's the (laughs) martyr syndrome. (laughs) And all our lives, we're taught self-sacrifice. To deny myself is what it takes to please God. And I'm not referring to ways we give and receive unselfish love. But if I accept that my good standing with God is solely His plan and His doing, then I have to stop trying to sacrifice myself. And I have to realize that Jesus' sacrifice for man was not a model behavior for me to imitate, but it's a gift for me to accept. And believing that God would accomplish His plan without my input Mm -hmm. Boy, it takes a lot of faith on my part. Amen. (laughs) Thank goodness your healthy psyche woke up and said, (laughs) you gots to go. That's right. Good for me. Yes. But it broke the hearts of my precious family and friends who were still in church and saw my leaving as my choosing the separation we all felt. There was no joy in that for any of us. Then, believe it or not, the day I told my parents I was no longer in church, air quotes, mm-hmm. it was on a Mother's Day. Oh, I remember. Oh, and I know I broke my mother's heart. She's the very person I would never want to hurt. And I know as soon as we hung up the phone that my mother's crying when it stopped enough to explain to my father that the first thing they did was to pray for me to come back to God. And uh, that's why I thought I was like Paul, because I don't know if his mother or father were alive after he had that experience that day on the road to Damascus and the big change. But in my mind, if they were, I can only imagine that they were in the same kind of emotional and physical pain that my parents felt. And I could imagine his mother pulling her hair and wailing and his daddy throwing dust on his head and tearing his clothes see the picture in my mind of all four of those parents, it breaks my heart. 
it causes us emotion even today, right. just thinking back on that. So, Mom, how were you able to reconcile those feelings with your actions after that? Well, only through the same help we all get, the promises of God. In fact, without the foundation of faith and the guidance and the unconditional love of my family, I would not have grown up with my desire to know God and a thirst for His truth, whatever that may be, and whoever it may come through. Because if we're not free to challenge our beliefs, then I believe our faith is in our concept of truth instead of in truth itself. Right. And it's our understanding that God's fulfillment of His promises to mankind, the timing, the reason, and the how, has brought us to see a much bigger view of God than we'd previously believed. Not that God had grown, but our new understanding of the breadth and depth of His love and the provision for those He loves was too big to be held in the old wineskins of our former understanding or imagination. God's presence now meant that we had formally said we believed and we admitted that God was omnipotent and omnipresent, but we actually denied that Mm -hmm. by avowing the limitations on where He could go and who He could or would be with. That's right. (laughs) So that's my story, and I'd like to end it with a quote from Leo Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. Love is life. All, everything that I understand, I understand only because I love. Everything is, everything exists, only because I love. Everything is united by it alone. Love is God. And to die means that I, a particle of love, shall return to the general and eternal source. So good. (laughs) High High five, five, Leo. Leo. Y'all, thank you so much for bearing with us as we pour our hearts into this podcast Mm -hmm. for you because, like I said, this was new for the two of us to do this together. But if you have questions or comments or if you want our address where you can send a trophy for excellent (laughs) performance, (laughs) no, uh, truly, we appreciate your feedback. And again, uh, info at presence.tv. Thank you all for joining us on this special episode. I'm overwhelmed with the outpouring of love um, over what we shared last week. And I hope this touches someone's heart and lets you know, if you are going through this, you are not alone and you are right where you're supposed to be. As always, I hope you get to truly understand and experience the joy of who you are by loving your number. See you soon.